Well, uh, thank you everyone for joining us here today uh, for the second International Energy and AI Conference. This is the first day of a three-day program, and we have a very exciting uh, range of talks from Dr. Jing Zhang from Elsevier, Dr. Alpha Lee from Cambridge, and Professor Venkat uh, Vish, uh, Vishapanam from Carnegie Mellon. So uh, I'm the chair, Dr. Billy Wu from Imperial College London, and what I'm going to do is just uh, essentially give a quick overview of the, today's proceedings. So first of all, welcome from the Board of Energy and AI. And the second International Conference of Energy and AI is associated with the Elsevier Journal Energy and AI. Uh, and uh, the board give a warm welcome to everyone here. And I just wanna say that um, a lot has changed in the past year. The first International uh, Conference on Energy and AI was held in 2020 at the very beginning of the year before the whole travel um, chaos uh, ensued. And this was at Tenjin University um, all that long time ago. And this was a nice um, uh, photo from the day. And hopefully in the years to come, we'll revert back to hopefully a physical engagement because I think we lose that interaction of networking with people and so on. And what I wanna say is that essentially the aim of today's event is to showcase hopefully the latest research and development in the applications of uh, artificial intelligence in energy-based research, and hopefully also to connect researchers in this area and create a dialogue. And that's why we've got a combination of different types of um, content that we're delivering today. So hopefully uh, you've seen online and also through the event invite that we've uploaded a number of talks from the community uh, about their research on both YouTube and Bilibili, which is the Chinese equivalent of YouTube, so, so that people can watch it in an asynchronous mode, so you can watch it at your convenience. And also we've got Twitter and also WeChat to hopefully engage in that active discussion about research and so on. But we've got a long range of talks and I do encourage people to actively go and have a look at those uh, materials. But anyway, I just wanted to quickly open out with a few words about the conference, uh, but I'm gonna quickly pass over to Dr. Jing Zhang, uh, who's from Elsevier. After that, we've got Dr. Alpha Lee and Professor Venkat Vishampanam, who's gonna be talking about their respective works, and then hopefully we'll break out into a discussion panel. So this is just the first day, and I encourage people to also attend the second and third days where we'll be having a focus on devices and also systems and community. And again, in those sessions, what we're gonna do is have a combination of talks, but also discussion panels. And we encourage everyone to post questions in the Q and A. What I'll do is that I'll try and curate them and try and get around to every single question, but apologies in advance if we don't manage to do that. So those were just quickly what I wanted to show. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Uh, we're pleased to have Dr. Alpha Lee with us. And Alpha is a group leader and Royal Society University Research Fellow in the Department of Physics at the University of Cambridge. His research focuses on data-driven materials discovery, specifically developing machine learning technologies and design and control um, energy materials. Before joining Cambridge, Dr. Lee was a Fulbright Scholar and a George Carrier Fellow at Harvard University and obtained his DPhil from the University of Oxford. He's been named as uh, by Forbes as 30 under 30 in science and healthcare in Europe. And we're pleased to uh, have his talk on data-driven understanding of battery degradation. So over to you, Alpha. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and thanks for having me uh, in this conference. Really nice to uh, meet you all uh, virtually. Uh, in my talk today, I want to talk about um, trying to understand and predict and control uh, battery degradation by combining uh, high content electrochemical signals uh, with advances in probabilistic machine learning. And the reason why we worry about uh, battery degradation, as you all know, is that um, battery degradation, um, battery fade can both be an annoyance in the best of uh, all cases or uh, outright uh, hazardous and unpredictable. Um, we only need to look at um, failure modes in electric vehicles and failure modes in uh, uh, personal electronic devices to realize that uh, battery failures, especially as uh, capacity, battery capacity increase, in, um, continues to increase, can be a very hazardous um, event. Um, and part of the reason why 
uh, it is uh, a particularly an annoying feature, I would argue, of battery is that um, two nominally identical or, or similar batteries from the same battery, different fates have used, uh, they, they might even look the same in the first few, first few hundred cycles, but then the failure modes can be drastically different as you go up to 500 cycles. So the question that we ask ourselves is, um, first, can we predict uh, what's the uh, fate of a battery, what's the remaining useful life or cycle life of a battery, uh, so that we can alert the user uh, if a battery uh, is going to fail, at least inform the user ahead of time that this failure is going to happen. So if, if, if you are, so battery two, uh, using battery two, then you might uh, appreciate a heads up at cycle 300 that the performance will drastically uh, degrade uh, uh, in the next few hundred cycles. And then the second, I guess, more constructive um, question we want to ask is, well, can we flip the question around and instead use machine learning to design better ways of charging batteries and to refine our understanding of battery state of health so that we can perhaps adaptively charge batteries so as to ensure that they last long um, uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, do not degrade abruptly. So these are the two questions that we want to answer. And, and I would argue, by the, hopefully by the end of my talk, I will convince you that the key to answering these questions lie not only in machine learning, but also in a more informative way of probing the internal state of a battery, uh, and devising better ways to understand and probe what's the internal uh, uh, state of a battery in operando without obviously performing invasive measurements. But before I talk about the technique that we have been thinking about, let's take a step back and ask the question, well, how, how, how are battery management systems in the status quo, uh, how, are they, how are they functioning and how are they, what kind of signals are they using to probe battery internal states? And I think this, uh, uh, I think pioneering paper uh, really uh, uh, highlights of advances in, in, in the field um, essentially, this, this paper published Nature Energy a few years ago, I think, showcased a, a, a very um, pioneering method in predicting battery uh, 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 state of health, and, and in particular, predicting battery cycle life. And the input that this model used, uh, which is, I think, common in the state of the art, is, as they say, the discharge voltage curves uh, during the operation. So, as you know, the idea is, you know, the, the battery management system would charge a battery, discharge a battery, and acquire uh, current voltage curves during charging and discharging. And this paper shows that you can use these charging discharging curves to predict, to hopefully predict future the future life of a battery and give diagnostic um, predictions. And, and this paper actually went, uh, pushed this really much um, a few steps ahead and actually used machine learning to extract features uh, from these charging discharging curves, showing that it it allows a pretty accurate prediction of cycle life given early cycle behavior. But nonetheless, regardless of how good the machine learning model is, it is fundamentally circumscribed by the quality of the input. Um, if you don't have informative input, there's nothing much the model can do. And so the question we so probe ourselves is, can we do better than just charging discharging curve? It is, if, if you just cur collect current and voltage, that's a very blunt instrument. Is there something more refined that we can do to, uh, to really probe the internal state of a battery. And a related work, which we're also very inspired by, is this work by uh, Daniel uh, Steingart in, 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 in Princeton, where he showed a, a couple of years ago, actually, that you can use acoustic signals. So sending a uh, sound wave through a battery and uh, looking at how the battery responds to sound waves and use that as a way to predict a battery state of health and predict um, remain, and, and quantities that remain in useful life, state of charge and state of health. And I think that's, again, really a, a pioneering work. But we thought, you know, electrochemical acoustic signals are very uh, interesting and um, uh, insightful, but can we sort of use or repurpose existing circuitries uh, without new techniques or new instruments, but still allowing us a very uh, nuanced understanding of battery internal state. And to this end, we turn to a, a relatively old, I would say, and, and, and perhaps commonly used technique in electrochemistry, which is electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Um, to put simply, it is um, frequency-dependent uh, resistance 
of a battery. Uh, you, you send in the periodic um, uh, signal and the current of voltage in the battery and you measure the a current of voltage response of that battery. And, and through that, you can map out the impedance of frequency dependent resistance. And this technique has been used uh, throughout, um, throughout the literature to characterize electrochemical systems. Um, and the typical way of analyzing it would be to fit impedance um, spectra to equivalent circuit models, um, capacitance, resistance type uh, models, and then use these uh, fitted quantities to try to intuit uh, and, 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 and provide justifications for electrochemical performance. But our hypothesis is that, well, you know, these electrochemical impedance spectra actually contains a lot more information than just maybe full, full width half maximum or effective capacitances or effective resistance. Actually, the whole spectrum itself gives you the response of the battery across different time scale. And, and, and as such, you can argue across different length scales. And so why not use the whole spectrum, right? Not any reduced representation, not at a particular frequency, but the whole spectrum as an input to machine learning. And in particular, these electrochemical impedance um, spectra are completely non-invasive. Uh, you do not need to uh, damage the battery to measure it. And um, one could, there are many uh, existing cycling infrastructure, which would allow you to measure EIS uh, either after charging or before charging. Uh, so this is not something we need necessarily as a, a complete revamp of battery management systems in order to realize these electrochemical signals. And so we thought, can we use this uh, as an input to predict battery health? Um, and so the input is one part, uh, very high content electrical signals like electrochemical you know, impedance. But if the flip side is, well, what is the machine learning framework that we will use to process these inputs so as to allow us to predict uh, broadly state of health, remaining useful life, uh, 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 cycle life, or, what, or, or whatnot. So what's the machine learning infrastructure? Well, to start simple, I would talk about something a little bit more uh, refined in the later part of my talk. But to start simple, we'll use a Gaussian process as a machine learning tool. Um, to put simply, you can think of Gaussian process as a uh, pattern matching uh, type algorithm. The idea is that, well, suppose I have acquired electrochemical impedance uh, spectra throughout the battery's life uh, for many different batteries. Now I have an unknown battery. I've cycled the battery a few times. I acquire an EIS, and my question is, well, what's the state of health of that battery? Well, you know, why not just say that the state of health of my unknown battery should be approximated by the state of health of the batteries in my training set that, that has the EIS that's the closest to my unknown battery. So a very simple pattern matching type algorithm, just um, what's the closest EIS to, the, to, to, my, to, to my battery in the training set and use that as a way to gauge what's the state of health of my unknown battery. And to put it in a more mathematical context, uh, the Gaussian process idea is simply saying that, or Colonel Rich, depending on which uh, school you come from, whether Bayesian or Frequentist, is basically saying that, you know, uh, I have an input X, which is my uh, electrochemical impedance uh, spectrum of my unknown new battery, which I have no idea how healthy or unhealthy it is. I've acquired the EIS, that's called X. And then I say, hey, I have a comparative function or kernel that compares this spectrum X to all my reference spectra uh, in my training set or my data set. And then I'm just saying that, you know, um, my output is a weight function of these similarities. And so if, it's a, if it is very similar to an unhealthy cell, oh, then that, my reference cell, my, my, my unknown cell would likely be predict to be unhealthy. If it is very similar to a healthy cell, then it is likely to be healthy. And in particular, in this comparison function, uh, does two things. The first is that it compares what spectra, which, which spectra in my training set is the closest to my unknown battery, but also it understands that not all frequencies in the electrochemical impedance spectrum are created equal that some frequencies are more informative than others. And so it automatically learns to deprioritize certain frequencies and prioritize others. And which frequencies to deprioritize and which frequencies to prioritize is inferred 
from the data. And that point will become very important later on. So just to uh, give you an over, uh, a, a summary of how well this works, um, this is trying to uh, do a very simple task. Um, I have a battery, I cycle this at a constant cycling protocol. After each cycle, I acquire EIS. And I ask the model, can you please predict what is the cycle number of this battery? Is it, in the is it in this first cycle, is it in the second cycle, is it in the third cycle, et cetera, et cetera. A very simple problem of minimal practical relevance, but nonetheless, I think, shows you a flavor of how these models work. The rare curve here is the EIS, is inputs using electrochemical impedance spectrum, showing that actually we can predict the cycle number of a battery very accurately with EIS. Um, the blue curve are um, features from the charging discharging curve, this is what I alluded to at the beginning, um, extracting features from IV traces during charging and discharging, showing that that, that manifestly gives a, a poorer prediction. And that's because there are many batteries uh, with similar charging discharging curves. Nonetheless, they have drastically different cycle numbers. Um, and therefore, this is not a very strong predictor of cycle number. Hence, you can think of as a very, very rough surrogate of battery health. And note, note that. Uh, not only we predict a number, but we also predict an uncertainty. And that's what um, the Gaussian process framework returns to the user, not only a prediction, but also error bars, i.e. how much you should be believe in the prediction. And here, uh, we are indeed able to identify uh, when the model actually will fail. The model knows when it, what it doesn't know. And the model will tell you uh, that this region is likely to be defective and uh, underperforming. And in fact, it is true. So I alluded to the fact that this Gaussian process model um, actually not only um, compares electrochemical impedance spectrum of my unknown battery with batteries in the training set, but it also learns to understand that not all frequencies are created equal and that some frequencies are just more important than others. And here we can actually interpret which frequencies are uh, leaned on significantly by the model, and it shows that it's a low frequency region that's actually very predictive. Um, magic frequency is perhaps a uh, uh, overly exaggerated uh, phrase, but nonetheless, it, it does tell you that there are certain frequency EIS that are important. And you know, the next question becomes, so what, what's happening in the low frequency regime? And we are still in the process of trying to triangulate low frequency response of EIS to other spectroscopic measurements just to understand what's going on. But, this is in principle interpretable technique, which allows you to understand what regions of the spectrum um, is the model looking at, and then try and generate therefore hypothesis on what's going on in the battery. So it's beyond just a, uh, a, a, a direct black box. Now, um, you can go beyond just identifying cycle number. Uh, so this is what I showed before, uh, but, the next question you want to ask is, well, can we predict uh, uh, batteries cycle at different temperatures? And, and, it shows, and, and this shows that we can actually if we train a, bat, train a system of battery cycle 25, 35, and 45 degrees. Uh, you can uh, take the, take the, take the take, um, batteries trained at lower temperatures and then extrapolate to predict the behavior of batteries at higher temperatures. And finally, uh, perhaps the most important aspect of what you what we really want to ask is, can you predict the remaining useful life? And remaining useful life means the number of cycles the systems the system have have re remaining before the discharge capacity drops below the seventy or eighty percent of the nominal capacity. And here we show that we can actually predict the remaining useful life um, with pretty uh, decent accuracy with EIS as the input. So that shows that EIS is indeed a, uh, the space of impedance is indeed a reasonable and physical uh, measurement of battery state, which can be fruitfully used to predict uh, battery degradation. Now, everything that we have done here, uh, I've shown thus far, focuses on pretty um, standard charging conditions. The next question we'll ask is, well, can we actually, um, what happens when you abuse a battery, uh, i.e. overcharge, over discharge it? 
And can does the space of EIS also informs you how the battery is being over, how the battery uh, was abused. And in particular, the experiment set up is we, we took LCO coin cells and we did many different ways of abusing it, fast charge, high temperature, overcharge, over discharge, uh, et cetera. And the question is, um, would the EIS spectra of these differently abused battery be very different? Um, and if so, can we use the EIS spectra to identify how has the battery been abused? And that serves two goals. The first is a practical one. You can tell the user, suppose a hypothetical user subjecting you to uh, giving you a battery, you can tell the user, well, this is how the battery was used um, and, and return a health metric. But on a more conceptual level, uh, if indeed the space of impedance spectra would cluster uh, based on different abuse conditions, then again, we know that this very informative uh, measurement is actually telling us something about the physical state of a battery, much like perhaps a biomarker is for the human body. And here we show that in the, in, this is a low dimensional projection of the different EIS spectra. We use a so-called Tisney projection, which is a way to project a very high dimensional uh, system. Uh, here, EIS typically acquired over hundreds of frequencies. We project it down to 2D for uh, simplicity of visualization. And here we again show that indeed the different abuse conditions, um, cells abuse under different conditions, sorry, um, cluster into different regions in 2D space. If we use EIS as an input, showing that the EIS is indeed, you may, if, if you may a biomarker of a battery and it tracks not only uh, how the battery was being, was being cycled, not tracks not only the health of the battery, but also potential abuses that the battery has been through. And in fact, if you abuse the battery differently, um, that particular battery will live in different regions of this EIS space. And that explains further why a high dimensional measurement of EIS is a, is a very uh, informative way to construct a machine learning model that predicts remaining useful life and other battery health metrics. So I've, everything that I've shown thus far for, uh, was on LCO um, graphite cells, coin cells. The next question you may ask is, well, how does this extrapolate different chemistries? Um, does it work for other types of battery geometries and different types of battery chemistry? And the, the short answer is it does. Uh, we tried this on NMC 111. This is cylindrical cell. Um, the, the, figure, the, the figure on the top show how wildly variable are the performance of some of these cells. And the uh, plot on the bottom is a representative curve showing that we can predict, again, remaining useful life are given EIS input. And the panel on the right is NMC811. This is actually a part of a Faraday degradation consortium. Um, they, they have consortium pouch cells that we cycled. Um, and again, we changed both the geometry and the chemistry. Um, the degradation performance is again, um, pretty um, variable. And again, in the, plot on the, on, on, in, in the bottom show that we can track the remaining useful life pretty well are using impedance as input. So, that, so what I've outlined thus far is not um, chemistry specific. It is actually generalizable um, across different cell geometry and across different cell chemistry. And they say that the over, under, underlying idea is simply that one should use um, combine high content electrical measurements like impedance with probabilistic machine learning to realize a predictive tool for remaining useful life or other battery health metric. The next question, um, is, well, you know, we have identified, so Gaussian process as, an, as, as, as a machine learning model. And one of the assumptions of Gaussian process is, is that it takes the current uh, EIS of the battery and try to predict remaining for life. How many cycles um, do the battery have left before it is completely degraded? But what this model ignores is history. It ignores EIS that uh, was acquired previously. It only looks as instantaneous snapshot and makes prediction about the future. One would argue if you can incorporate, find a way to incorporate historic information, i.e. How, how the EIS looked like in previous cycles, then maybe that would allow the model to do even better because it can understand not only the EIS itself, but also changes in the EIS over time and use this to make a even more general even more predictive prediction about the future. To realize this type of machine learning, uh, we turn to the uh, recent literature on sequence modeling. 
now we are no longer doing just an input to output, but we have a long, we have a time ordered input, uh, i.e. Uh, spectra that, that, that are collected uh, in the past. And we want to ask the question, well, can we, can, can you build a model that actually understands time domain dependencies so that you can learn from everything in the past to predict the future. And one um, model, one prototype of, of such a model is uh, so-called long short-term memory, LSTM. There are many other implementations as well. And the, in the key philosophy is so-called recurrent neural network or the recurrent philosophy, which is you, you feed in the spectrum to the model. The model spits out of the, let's say cycle one, and then it spits out the capacity. And then that, uh, that model then distill a representation of that EIS. And then when you feed in the next cycle EIS, it combines this with the representation of the previous EIS and then predicts the next cycle capacity. And then uh, in, in the third cycle, this hidden state from cycle two um, actually contains information with EIS from cycle two, but also EIS from cycle one. So it has a summary of everything in the past. And it uses it mixes this summary with the current EIS to predict uh, the current capacity, and so on and so forth, until you reach at the end of life. And this is a very simple sequence-based approach. There are many other methods out there in literature, but the hypothesis we want to test is what well, does incorporating time domain recurrence actually help modeling? And the quite and the answer is that it does. This is NMC eight one one pouch cells. The question we ask is, can we predict the discharge capacity from the EIS of the fully charged state? A very simple toy problem. Uh, and the answer is yes, we can. We, we can significantly improve in, improve in prediction uh, accuracy if we go from a single time point Gaussian process-based method to a recurrent neural network RSTM-based method where the network or the model not only understands the current EIS, so predicting the discharge capacity of EIS of fully charged state, but also the EI, the impedance spectra of all the fully charged states preceding the current measurement. And so actually understanding history actually helps model performance. I think that again, perhaps um, uh, change some of the thinking in BMS design is not only the current cycle that matters, actually historic data of how the battery uh, was performing can inform predictions and extrapolate towards the future. Uh, every, um, thus far, I've only been talking about, um, I guess, broadly speaking, diagnosis. Um, given a battery, can I predict remaining useful life? Can I predict the capacity? Can I predict the cycle number? And that's fine if you're trying to just understand how a battery is functioning or not functioning. But ultimately, perhaps one would like to use this information to control a battery and try to extend its life. Um, and that requires us to uh, incorporate an element of uh, control into, into cycling and, and understanding how that uh, can be done with high content measurement. And I would like to show you a prototype uh, of, of, of realizing aspects of control. And the idea is the following, you, you, have, a, you have a battery, you've used it over time, and then suppose I, for, for sake of argument here, for simplicity here, do not have any historic information with historic usage pattern of battery. So you can imagine an electric vehicle user using electric vehicles, driving it around and then charging this vehicle in different charging stations. And then that vehicle uh, you wrote, got rolled up in a, in, 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 in a charging station. And the question is, can this charging station or can this machine sense a, an electrical signal into the battery that is informative enough such that it understands the internal state of the battery. And then it can pick which charging protocol uh, one should use to optimize or minimize capacity fade. And, and this char these charging protocols can range from changing the charging time to even within the charging time, different ways of charging a battery con constrained to charging time. And the question is, can we pick what's the best charging protocol to minimize capacity fade? That, that, that will be sort of the overall vision. And what I want to show you in the next slide is a, is, a, is, a sub, is, a, is a subset of this, which is, can we abstract away from what is typically done in, in, in the literature or battery testing, which is cycling the battery under the same condition over and over again, 
and trying to predict remaining useful life or whatnot, can we abstract away from that and instead ask the question, if the battery has been cycled using unknown conditions, um, can we still predict uh, what will be the impact of the next cycling condition on subsequent capacity? And the answer is that we can with probabilistic machine learning with EIS as input, here the battery is cycled under different conditions which, which are unknown to the algorithm. We acquire EIS and the algorithm can predict very accurately what's the impact of the next cycling protocol on the next subsequent discharge capacity. And so that gives you a much more concrete uh, understanding of battery health because the battery health is now actually dependent on the internal state. And with the help of an algorithm, you can, you can predict how different charging protocols would affect the future fate of the battery uh, given this internal state. Uh, in a summary, we have combined high content electrical signals to predict battery health and probabilistic ML to estimate uncertainty, and we built towards a prototype BMS for diagnosis and control. With that, I really thank my collaborators in Newcastle, Uli, Chao Chun, Jabin, and my postdoc, Yun Wei, and student Penny, and all my uh, funding sources. Um, with that, thank you very much for your attention. I'll open this up to any questions. Great, right, fantastic, Alpha. It's great to see such a, a breadth of uh, work in a very exciting field. Maybe what we'll do is we'll take a, a couple of quick questions and then we'll save uh, a lot of the active discussion for the discussion panel with Jing and Benkat. Um, so, uh, Yifu Wang asks, um, with your approach for taking impedance data, um, how do you actually take that? Is it the charge transfer resistance, constant phase elements? Which uh, part of the spectra is most important for your uh, lifetime predictions? That's a great question. We actually feed the whole spectrum. We take the whole spectra into the model and we take the spectra after the battery is fully charged, take the spectra after the battery fully discharged uh, and up, take another spectra after resting. And our experience is that uh, the spectra after resting, either fully charged or fully discharged, gives you the most information. In terms of which portion of the spectrum is most important, uh, the coin cells we investigated shows that it is a low frequency regime that is most important. Uh, we have we have yet been able to yeah we are still trying to correlate this with specific um, uh, quantities in the equivalent circuit models. Uh, but I think in general, in in coin cells at least, we found that it's a low frequency region. All right, great. And maybe one more. So I suppose you touched on this briefly. Uh, did you try to incorporate historical EIS data into your uh, Gaussian process model rather than shifting uh, to a LSTM model uh, in order to achieve probabilistic predictions? Uh, yeah, uh, not sure how one could. We, we have not figured out how to do a recurrent um, Gaussian process. I think it would be probably technically doable, but not sure how to set, set it up. Uh, typically these recurrent time series models are done with RNNs or whatnot, but one could do uncertainties in RNN, for example, by training ensemble, and then you can have, you can take the mean and the variance. Uh, we have not looked into that, but that would be, I think, very interesting. All right, fantastic. Well, I can still see we've got quite a few questions, but maybe what we'll do is that we'll pivot back to Jing um, to give us a talk. Um, are you with us, Jing? Yes. Fantastic. And I see we've got Venkat as well. Hi, Venkat. I believe that. Great. Um, so, Jing, are you able to share your screen? And we'll pivot to you and then to Venkat shortly after that. Sure. Perfect. Um, so, uh, first of all, let me just uh, do a quick introduction to Jing. So, Dr. Jing Zhang is an executive publisher with Elsevier, managing a list of 10 flagship journals in the field of energy, including energy and AI energy, applied energy, energy conversion and management, and so on. Her main responsibilities include uh, delivering the st uh, strategy and objectives for the maintenance, development, and growth of the portfolio, working closely with the academic community, communicating and networking with editors, authors, reviewers, and researchers. Prior to her uh, current role with Elsevier, she was part of the publishing team uh, leading uh, with Frontiers, an open access publisher responsible for the open access content development via uh, research topic acquisitions. Uh, before that, she was a senior publisher with Elsevier managing a list of engineering journals. And today she's going to talk about energy and AI one year on. So over to you, Jing. Thank you, Billy. And thank you for the introduction. 
Um, thank you for having me in this second international conference on energy and AI. And apologies for the earlier issue, technical issues. And ho hopefully that my internet will um, do me a favor and last for the next 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so as we're enjoying this second conference, um, uh, the journal Energy and AI is also one year old and soon to reach the second full year actually. So um, there is a natural and deep link between the journal and the conference, which support and complements each other. So I think it's a good opportunity to share with you all the uh, development of the journal and inviting you all to continue to support the journal, um, as well as supporting the development of this cross-discipline uh, field, spanning from energy to artificial intelligence. Um, energy and AI uh, was launched in 2020 last year as a gold open access journal so that all papers published um, in the journal will be made available um, for everyone uh, immediately and permanently. And of course, authors need to pay um, an article processing charge upon acceptance. Uh, but for the first year, we um, waived all the APCs for the uh, articles. Um, and we now uh, apply a 25% discount for all the spontaneous submissions. But we also have some other uh, waiving and discounts policies that I will talk about in a minute. Um, so um, since, uh, uh, since it was launched last year, uh, so far, uh, we have received over 300 uh, submissions um, and we published over 80 um, papers. And we are also um, uh, very quick in processing uh, the papers. So now it's um, less than eight weeks from submissions to acceptance. Um, and um, this journal um, is now indexed in DOAJ and Scopus, and we are now applying for the um, um, uh, Clarit indexation. Um, so this journal has very diverse author distributions, and this year, year to date, the top five contributing countries are China, US, UK, Germany, Denmark, and a few other um, uh, countries. And for this, um, this 80 uh, papers, we already uh, received over 150,000 um, downloads, which is remarkable. And there was one article, one single article, uh, received over 10,000 downloads. Um, so this is, um, you know, all um, down to our um, hardworking editors, uh, our voluntary um, reviewers and others who um, supported us uh, from the start um, to submit their, their high quality papers to a new journal um, initially without any indexation um, and reputation. Uh, we have very high um, aspiration impact for this journal and this is how we have worked towards and this cannot be achieved without your trust and support. Um, I uh, would like to talk a little bit um, about open access, uh, which I'm sure you, you all uh, have heard of. Um, so elsewhere is um, uh, moving uh, uh, very fast to meet the different demands of OA. Um, in 2020, um, the full year, we uh, published um, 81,000 uh, gold open access articles, which is about 65% um, growth on the previous year. Um, and today, um, Elsevier is one of the world's uh, fast, fastest growing uh, open access publishers. And we, um, as you know, that Elsevier has over um, uh, 2,800 journals. Now, uh, the majority of them are hybrid. Uh, meaning that you can either publish your paper as a um, um, publish under either uh, subscription or open access. And in addition to that, we now have over 500 uh, full, fully um, open access journals and energy and AI is part of them. 
um, so far, um, Elsevier has uh, reached open access um, agreement with a list of uh, institutions as showed it in this table. Um, and we are adding more um, OA agreements to the list so that others don't need to pay from their own pockets. Um, and the fee uh, will be covered uh, uh, centrally, either by the funding bodies, the institutes, or on a national level. So if you want to know more details or check if your institutes have reached agreements, you can go to this website, uh, elsewhere.com, um, open access, and you'll find more. Um, for energy and AI, uh, uh, particularly, um, although the uh, general waiving policy has ended, we do have policy now to support invited content. Um, so this includes invited articles uh, by our editors or the special issue articles invited by the guest editors. Um, so all the fee um, in those two categories will be fully waived. Um, so if you want to submit to the journal, uh, and if your paper uh, matches one of the open special issues, um, do seize opportunity and submit before the end of this year. So the policy, the current policy is before the end of this year. And um, we're not sure whether we're gonna extend that to the next year or we'll have something new for next year. So if you want, if you, you, you're interest, interested in the journal, um, before this, uh, before the end of this year, uh, it will be all free to submit to the special issues. Um, and we, so in, in addition to this, we also have um, automatic article publishing charge waivers or discounts uh, to the articles uh, 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 for authors who, who are based um, in a country um, from this research for life program. So we, I think there, there's a um, um, uh, category A and a category B countries. So some of them will receive full waiver and some of them uh, will receive 50% uh, uh, discounts. So do check that. Okay, so uh, and next I um, would like to touch on two initiatives that we started this year, uh, which you, you, you may be interested to know. So one is about improving author experiences. Um, in the past, Elsewhere has um, done a lot of initiatives to improve author experiences. Uh, for example, um, there was a program called uh, Your Paper, Your Way, which is now like the norm for all the journals, so that you don't need to um, submit a paper with perfect, perfect uh, reference styles. You can just uh, submit your paper with um, any reference styles uh, and then only when your paper is accepted, you are asked to um, uh, match the uh, reference um, requirements for that specific journal. Um, and now we have this new or this improved author service called Article Transfer Service. Um, so the, um, the, the goals are, are, are simple. Um, so first of all is to in, uh, increase author publication uh, success. Um, a second of all, uh, seamless transfer between journals, um, aiming convenient, fast, and easy. And the third is improved production uh, workflow in terms of both quality and speed. So what happens is, um, so when you submit uh, to a journal, but the, the, the paper is rejected by the editor, and then your paper will, you will receive an email offering the transfer to other journals or one or a, a small list of alternative journals. And if you agree to accept that offer, your paper will be automatically transferred uh, to that journal uh, without resubmitting um, to the journal. Um, and then um, if the paper is accepted in the um, journal B, the alternative journal, it um, shortens the um, submission process and uh, uh, improves the author um, experiences. Um, so we have uh, in-house editors or external um, editors 
um, who have the expert knowledge to make recommendations of other journals to you. So once um, um, your, your, your paper is rejected by journal A, they will consider the quality of your paper, um, the scope of your paper, and then suggest one uh, to three journals to you um, to increase the chance um, of the acceptance of your paper and a quicker turnaround time. Uh, we are still um, um, at the early stage, uh, piloting a, a limited number of journals. But if you recently submitted to energy um, conversion and management and unfortunately got rejected, you may have been involved in this service. You may have been offered a transfer to other journals. Um, so this, this is one um, also service I would like to, um, to uh, let you all know today. Um, and second um, initiative is, well, this is not new and this is not for um, elsewhere only, um, but elsewhere is deeply committed to this um, SDGY which promotes gender equality. Um, and um, as such, we have embarked on standardizing policies around diverse, diversifying our editorial boards. So in this initial stage, we focus on gender. Um, and we uh, strongly encourage uh, women scientists to join our editorial boards and we will make the gender distribution of the journal um, editorial board more visible on all the journal homepages um, later on, so as shown on the uh, right hand side. So you may already um, have seen such banners on some journals, and we will make that more um, uh, um, general in other journals as well. And also we, we, we did a call for women editors campaign um, a few weeks ago. Um, to encourage um, uh, female um, researchers to uh, get involved in the journals. Um, and you can see that we, we are not only um, trying to reach gender balance for journals, we also have um, targets for conferences. For example, uh, in the, the last four years, we have increased the participation of women invited speakers at about 50 elsewhere um, owned conferences from 15% to um, 32%. And we continue to work towards greater gender diversity. Um, and um, you may have heard that for uh, Lancet and the Cell, they also have very um, ambitious goals. For example, for Lancet, they have uh, established a 50-50 gender ratio and they are now um, kind of banning all the all man conferences, which is also um, the action um, to uh, promote uh, gender equality, gender balance. Um, and we'll continue to support this uh, on all our journals. Um, and I'm very delighted to see that for energy and AI, we actually have a special issue dedicated for, for this topic. Um, and we will continue to support similar initiatives um, in promoting uh, gender um, equality. Um, so, well, that's all from me. Um, uh, it's it's a, a quick update on the journal and invitation to you all to continue to support the journal, uh, either by submitting to the journal or reviewing for the journal, or if you're interested to get involved um, to, to be an editor now or in the future. So at the um, end, I would like to again say thank you to all of you, authors, reviewers, editors, and all the contributors to the journal. Um, and thank you for your trust, support, and contribution. And the journal cannot be successful without your support. And thank you again. Um, that's all from me, Billy. Great, thank you very much, Jing, for a, a really interesting talk, especially about how uh, Elsevier and the publishers are aiming for equality across uh, the field. Uh, uh, now we have our 
uh, third speaker. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Venkat uh, Vishankhanam. Uh, he is an associate professor of mechanical engineer, uh, engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. He leads an interdisciplinary group comprising of 30 researchers working on technologies that can accelerate the transition to sustainable transportation and aviation. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including the MIT Technology Review Innovators Under 35, Office for Naval Research Young Investigators Award, and Alfred uh, Sloan Research Fellowship in Chemistry and Natural Science Foundation Career Award. And he's gonna to talk today about robotic experimentation and machine learning for next generation batteries. So once again, thank you very much for joining us, Venkat, and over to you. All right, super. Uh, thanks, thanks, Billy. And uh, I decided to focus on the uh, robotic experimentation part because I, I figured Alpha would uh, would give a, a strong overview of the machine learning side. So uh, uh, I'm going to express um, uh, sort of a journey that we've been through over the last four or five years or so. Um, as a computational researcher, one of the sort of uh, frustrating parts about uh, feedback is waiting for the experimentalists to give you the answer. Uh, so uh, we have been on this journey to try and um, automate and roboticize that. Okay, so I'm actually just going to uh, give a, a plug for something that just dropped today. So uh, flash alert. Uh, so we actually dropped a manuscript on iron air, uh, which um, uh, turns out to be quite interesting for stationary storage. Um, so uh, those of you that are interested, go, go check it out. The preprint just went live. Steve Levine just wrote an article about uh, about this, um, uh, and and I think it's a new exciting avenue for for stationary storage. Okay, so I'm going to just step in uh, and and start with uh, a description of commercialization uh, of energy innovations. Uh, and so uh, this is a wonderful chart put together by uh, Pranesh C. Gopal, who was a who was a venture capitalist. Um, uh, and he's funded a number of battery companies. Uh, and so uh, there's sort of uh, uh, an arc to the development of, of, a, of a company. And of course, uh, you could also view this as the arc of any research project also, but, uh, but I think it's a useful framework to think about. So when at the beginning, right, um, you know, you are, um, uh, you have sort of lots of great ideas and uh, you're, you're creating new technology. Uh, and so you're in this exciting seed stage, right? And there's sort of, uh, two options at the end of it, right? At the end of the seed stage, maybe uh, you exit. Um, uh, more than likely, uh, that means that you get acquired by someone and someone else is taking that project forward or, or, or company forward. Uh, but then you have this long arc, which is the development cycle, uh, which basically uh, involves very lengthy commercialization phase where the core concept is clear, uh, the material set is somewhat uh, nailed down and you have to try and optimize it, right? You have to optimize it to get to the performance specs uh, to address uh, the challenges associated with meeting all the performance requirements uh, for battery technologies. Once you do that, once you get past this, right, then uh, you can get into this revenue generation phase uh, where uh, you're capital efficient, you, 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 know, you have lots of you know, exciting things in the pipeline and that allows you to sort of create value. So you know, any, uh, any sort of next generation company uh, should try to to bring down the development cycle so that you can get to the revenue generation part as quickly as possible. Now you can ask the question, how long is this? Uh, and so uh, here's this graph uh, of how long it took to commercialize across sectors, right? So you'll see different kinds of technology, right? From thin film transistors to lithium ion batteries to um, cassette recorders, mobile phones, et cetera. Uh, so this is the time it took from the beginning of the invention to commercialization, right? And uh, you notice that uh, you know, there's sort of a period where, you know, there's, there's, you know, invention, development, and demonstration. This is sort of the early tech demonstration phase. And then you see this very long yellow bar, uh, right, which requires uh, sort of the long commercialization and, and, and market deployment phase. And so the goal is to try and figure out how robotic experimentation could sort of shrink all of this, right? Uh, I'm going to present this in the context of research in the lab. But then you can easily see this sort of extrapolating forward um, and, and, and translating to, uh, to companies being able to accelerate faster. Okay, uh, I'm going to actually present a viewpoint, right, uh, which is uh, actually borrowed by Bryce Meredith, who, um, uh, who's at Citrine. Um, and uh, he, he sort of makes this, uh, you, know, you know, tells this very interesting story that 
Um, I think at least maybe this image uh, gives away my age, or, or you know, maybe some of you might uh, might know this, right? Uh, this is the famous game between Gary Kasparov and, and Deep Blue. Uh, the second one, right? The first one, Gary won. The second one, um, Deep Blue won, um, which was uh, a machine from IBM. Uh, and after he lost, uh, you know, I think he he was sort of ruminating, and then he created this this no, new concept called Centaur Chess. And the idea here was that <clears throat> uh, Centaur Chess is an, is a concept where you combine computers' ability for brute force computation with humans' ability for creativity, right? So, which basically means that you're trying to sort of merge the two together. Uh, and so, in that same style, I would advocate that you know we have a unique opportunity uh, where uh, you basically could combine human creativity with computers' ability to do brute force computation together to be able to create and iterate faster, right? And so the central thesis is, could we have a paradigm where man plus machine is greater than man or machine, right? And, and, the, and the reason it's, it's called Centaur is Centaur is uh, for this man plus horse, right? Uh, to sort of uh, both have direction as well as, as, as pace. This is actually a photo from Pompeii from uh, a time when we could, uh, we could travel freely. Okay, uh, so now the question is, how do we put all of these ideas in practice, right? So this is the first vision. Uh, so this is an, a crazy uh, project that we proposed to Toyota Research Institute uh, with uh, my colleague Jay Whitaker, uh, partner in crime on this. Uh, and so the, the core question we tried to ask was, um, could we try to automate discovery of electrolytes? Uh, and so what is an electrolyte, right? Electrolyte simple. Uh, you have a solvent and you have a salt and you pick that. And once you pick that, then uh, you can basically design an electrolyte. Um, and uh, so the goal here was we took, uh, we take some design space, right? Some number of salts and solvents. Uh, and uh, we would have some sort of, you know, uh, design of experiments. I'll come back to how that is. Then we have a robot, which, you know, first robot we built, which is called Auto. And Auto is a function evaluator, which is basically a measurement, right? And I think if I were, if you, if you were to take away with one sort of key insight, which is that every experiment simply is a function evaluation. Now, once you have that function evaluation, right, uh, then you can infer from that, right? So it's from the measurement you're trying to process and get things, for example, like bulk conductivity, uh, electrochemical stability, et cetera. And then what you want is based on that output, you have to decide what to do next, right? So that's basically sort of a, a closed loop design where uh, you can essentially do autonomous discovery uh, once sort of the design space is set up. Uh, and so, uh, so the, the, the sort of way this works is, um, uh, so the auto is a system that's sort of web connected. Uh, and the core idea is there is Dragonfly, which is a Bayesian optimizer. And I'll give you some details of how that works. Uh, it requests an experiment. So it requests an experiment through this Python API. That Python API then uh, orchestrates through LabVIEW um, the experiment. Uh, the experiment itself is, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it's it's sort of a, a ballet of things that happens. Uh, the core uh, the core pieces to pay attention to are we have a bunch of different feeder solutions. So the feeder solutions allow us to move in composition space uh, to different compositions, uh, and then it, it's a flow through setup. So it flows through uh, all of these things. We have a pH probe, um, we have a conductivity probe, uh, we have an electrochemical cell which can be programmed. So basically you can get any electrochemical test. And the first setup was outside the glove box. So it was an aqueous setup. And the second setup, Clio, is inside the glove box. So, so first one is aqueous electrolytes. Second one is non-aqueous electrolytes. And you can, you can go through this paper where we did a lot of sort of very careful calibration and, and testing uh, of this uh, setup itself. OK, so the setup works. And uh, it basically, in about uh, 20 minutes, uh, can evaluate uh, a, a function value, which means that for any new electrolyte, it can tell you what the conductivity is, what the high voltage, what the voltage stability is. Okay. Um, so uh, what we tried to do was we the first problem we went after was to try and find an aqueous electrolyte that would be counter to uh, what's called the water activity design rule. There's a lot of interest in uh, the so-called um, uh, highly concentrated electrolytes where you put a lot of salt into the system. And if you put a lot of salt, then you can stretch the voltage stability of water uh, to over, well over two volts, right? So which is sort of what uh, you, know, you use today in lead acid batteries, right? You can basically get to about three volts or so. The general wisdom is that in order to increase the voltage stability, you need to increase the, increase the salt concentration or decrease the water concentration. 
So what we wanted to do was to try and get the robot to find something that is opposite to this human intuition, human design rule, right? So that, that was the core goal here. And we ran this, um, uh, uh, we ran this, uh, 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 we ran auto in autonomous mode, which means there was no human intervention, right? Absolutely no human intervention. Um, and, and we ran it for 40 hours uh, straight. Um, and, um, and, and with that, we tried to optimize a four component system. So very common salts, sodium nitrate, sodium sulfate, sodium bromide, sodium perchlorate. Actually turns out that sodium bromide in here uh, turns out to be a bad actor. Uh, and we'll see uh, Dragonfly learning that response and, and learning to avoid sodium bromide. Okay, so what did we, uh, how do we sort of pull this off, right? So uh, what happens is the following, uh, what, how does Dragonfly work? So you perform the experiment, right? So you perform the experiment and then you get an answer, right? With the answer, um, what Dragonfly does at the back end is it trains a Bayesian model. In, in fact, it turns out to be that it, it, it trains the same kind of Gaussian process regression models uh, that Alpha talked about. Um, uh, and then once you have that, the beauty about GPR is that it both gives you a, a value as well as an uncertainty. Uh, and so with that, it, you can basically trade the right amount of exploration and exploitation. So there's a bunch of different recommendation algorithms. Recommendation algorithms are simply what to do next, right? So deciding what to do next in the in the phase space. Uh, and so uh, here it has sort of four different uh, so-called acquisition functions. Um, and so um, the four acquisition functions are, are Thompson, upper confidence fund, expected improvement, and top two expected improvement. I'll, I'll just talk through two things uh, so that you get an intuition for what's happening with these acquisition functions. Okay, so first is, some, uh, is, is, uh, is Thompson sampling. Um, and so what is happening here is what you want to do is you want to find the maximum of some function, right? So you want to find maximum conductivity or maximum high voltage stability, et cetera. Uh, and so what you've done is you've measured some points. So the measured points are the axis here, right? Um, and uh, this black curve is sort of the true curve, right? And, um, and so what you have uh, is, uh, is basically uh, the, the green line is a Bayesian model that, that it pulls, right? So it, it basically draws a function uh, from this, uh, and then it picks the point at which the function is maximum, right? So it's simple, right? It's greedy. Uh, it thinks that whatever your response you have is good. I'm going to go and find the point. I'm going to evaluate at the point where the green curve is maximum. Okay, so that's Thompson sampling. Uh, now, uh, this is not always the best thing to do because what this allows you to do is it generally biases to regions where you know uh, what's happening, and then um, and then you try to sort of search there. Uh, this is not always good, and so you want to also explore. Uh, and so, how do you explore? Uh, you you use this. Um, uh, Gaussian process upper confidence bound. Actually, actually, this was done by uh, someone that used to be my high school benchmate, uh, funny enough. Um, uh, and uh, he came up with this method where uh, the idea here is you don't just pick the, the, the mean, but you pick, you add the uncertainty. Uh, and so you pick the value that is the maximum, including the uncertainty or the upper confidence bound. And so what this allows you to do is sample regions where you would have very high uncertainty, right? So uh, you can see here, uh, intriguingly, right, between these two dots, we don't have too much information. So you, even though the actual response might be uh, small, um, uh, you, your uncertainty is large. So that means that there is a small chance that your, your, uh, your best candidate might lie there. Okay, so this uh, allows us, uh, these, these are two sampling strategies that allow you to explore and exploit. And uh, EI and top to EI are, are, are two other uh, uh, Acquisition functions that are generally on the on the exploitation side. Okay, uh, and this is open source, so you can go and, and use it um, um, use it as you please. Okay, so with that we put this to test. Okay, and so what is what we tried to optimize was those four salts, and we tried to uh, optimize for the voltage stability. Right. So what is the voltage stability to when it forms when it evolves hydrogen on one side, evolves oxygen on the other side. Okay, and so these are the measurements, right? So this is the measurement. Um, so there's some starting region where it's sort of making some random measurements, right? And you see that there's a lot of dots here, right? A lot of dots that are small, that are low, and then some dots that are high. All the dots that are generally low are things that involve sodium bromide, right? And it quickly learns that as soon as you add any amount of sodium bromide, your performance is bad. And that's because the bromine, it gets oxidized. So uh, that sets the, the stability window here, not hydrogen evolution and oxygen evolution. 
but very quickly, it starts to find very, very good candidates. And it actually finds a candidate that was strict, that is strictly better than the single component best, which was sodium perchlorate. Uh, and it turns out that it's about 20, 25 millivolts better, uh, this blend E. Uh, so it turns out to be that it finds an electrolyte that's counter to that design rule. Uh, what did it find? It found an electrolyte that, that takes mostly sodium perchlorate, uh, but then adds a small amount of sodium nitrate, right? And so uh, the combined molarity of the salt is less than the sodium perchlorate, which means that blend E has more water, less salt, completely counter to what you would originally pick if you wanted to find an electrolyte that was much better. Now, uh, what happens when you take it out of the loop and like put it to real test? This is now um, uh, what are called TAFL plots. Uh, and the, the analysis, the, the blend E is strictly better. Uh, this is actually very, very robust. Uh, so blend E just performs better than, than sodium perchlorate. Uh, of course, you know, ultimately you want to put this into a full cell, right? So we put that into a full cell, full working cell here. Um, uh, we used uh, NATP uh, and activated carbon. So capa pseudo capacitive on one side and, and, uh, and intercalation on the other side. Uh, with that, we have uh, one of the highest performing cells. Uh, uh, the most interesting thing is we have one of the highest performing cells with a lower salt concentration, right? That's the interesting thing here. And of course, cost of the electrolyte scales as a salt concentration because salt, the more salt you need, the, the more expensive your, your electrolyte is. Okay, um, so this shows that, you know, things are working. Uh, and in fact, we, we got quite lucky that this got featured in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it turns out that they ran the story on the day of, uh, of elections. Um, so when uh, people were trying to grapple with what's happening, what's going to happen for the future, uh, they, all they wanted was to understand uh, AI and, uh, and uh, electrolytes. Okay, um, this is sort of the first gen. Uh, can we take this one step above? Okay. And so this is our second robot, uh, which is Clio. Uh, Clio basically is inside the glove box. Uh, and Clio now uh, can do many more things than Otto. Uh, Clio can characterize conductivity, viscosity, density, uh, all controlled uh, via, um, again, through HTTP via a Python class. Uh, and we also have um, uh, retains uh, for uh, cell testing afterwards. Um, and so what we do is we, we test it, and then we keep the electrolyte, and then that electrolyte then is put inside um, uh, different kinds of uh, cells, and then we test them uh, for uh, performance, for cycle life, et cetera. Uh, so I'm going to just show you one one quick thing of, of Clio in action. So this is basically now doing an electrolyte optimization over EC, DMC, DEC, right? So all kinds of interesting electrolytes now open up, right? Uh, and uh, so here we're trying to optimize for conductivity, right? Um, in, in about 15 experiments, it automatically searches over this very complicated phase space. Uh, so here we're trying to optimize for DMC to DEC ratio. Um, it very quickly finds this. Um, we've now done many, many, many other kinds of optimization. In fact, we've done this full loop now. We find an electrolyte that's better, uh, higher conductivity. Uh, we put that into a full cell, show that it's better for fast charging, right? So we now have a closed loop sort of design uh, space. Now, the, the vision here is eventually to pair this with the kind of machine learning models uh, that, uh, that Alpha talked about. And we have a lot of work going on in that, that space. I just didn't get time to talk about it. Uh, so I think the vision here is that you basically can have sort of this, uh, you know, wonderful command center from which you basically can do uh, electrolyte optimization all around. Um, okay, uh, one other thing, uh, one other plug I'll tell you is, you know, do all these things work on the field? Uh, does it actually happen in practice? And so a company uh, that I'm very closely involved with, where I'm a chief scientist, Aonix has deployed actually many of the methods that uh, actually, Alpha showed earlier, right? So around uh, machine learning predicted cycle life for early early prediction, uh, it's actually a modified version of the Severson model. It actually works on the field, like it works on field data. We we see this uh, accelerating early stage R and D. Um, this is of course another kind of electrolyte optimization where uh, you know salt and solvent optimization uh, for cycle life. You know all this sort of just works, right? And so we're in a very very exciting time where machine learning if done right, basically can eliminate 90% of, of experiments, uh, cut down um, the number of sort of false positives and false negatives. Uh, and the future is really, really bright for uh, energy and, and, and AI. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, you know, it's appropriate time for, uh, you know, a journal like this uh, to, to be started. Okay, uh, with that, I'll thank uh, Billy for the invitation to speak and, uh, you know, all the people that did the work. Um, and then uh, thank you for your attention. 
Great. Thanks, uh, Venkat. It's really an uh, eye-opening talk and, you know, really tackling some of the uh, biggest issues in our field. I might take the uh, chair's prerogative and ask a question that as um, with these techniques, which hope to accelerate the rate of development, as we increase the dimensionality, do you see the tools that we currently have been sufficient? So let's say, for example, if you were developing a solid state battery where there's so many other things, anode, cathode, electrolyte, do you think we have the existing frameworks or do we need something new beyond that? Yeah, so I think, uh, so the, the, which is why we carefully picked uh, liquid electrolytes, right? So uh, handling solids is very, so handling solids in like a robotic setup is, is we're nowhere near. And I think the other thing is, uh, if you noticed, I, I, I picked properties that were single components, uh, the component properties, right? The, uh, the electrolyte itself. But of course, we know that all the action inside a battery happens at interfaces, right? So, uh, so how do we catch interfaces, right? Uh, so I think we are, I think we have gotten to the point where we're very good at doing component level, but of course, component level doesn't translate to device level because there's a, the, the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the famous quote, right? Um, that, uh, you know, uh, God created crystalline materials, devil created interfaces, right? So the, you know, all, all the action unfortunately happens in the interface. Um, so I think we need significantly better tools to both visualize, uh, diagnose um, what's happening at the interface. Um, and I think, uh, you know, many of the stuff that's going on um, at the Faraday Institution, et cetera, I think, that, you know, those are all building the capability as well as I think we need a baseline set of open source capabilities so that, you know, people can build on top of it, um, both in terms of modeling, uh, as well as in terms of sort of processing uh, experimental data. So uh, I think there's a big gap for interfaces. I think that's, that would be, you know, for all the sort of uh, younger folks out there, right? You know, go after the interfaces. Fantastic. And one other question. Um, um, so you've done, a, obviously the narrative at the moment is a lot on electric vehicles, but I, I know that you've done a lot of work on electrified air flight. Uh, looking beyond that, <laughs> are there other, other emerging uh, electrification modes that you think are interesting? And that you think current energy storage technologies are okay for, but still haven't been fully optimized for? And what can the community do to kind of stimulate that activity as we try to electrify all modes of transport? Yeah, so I think uh, I think we actually have a lot. Of, we actually have a lot of very interesting work going on, and uh, we, we may we, we're, we're trying to put together a big institute for uh, for electric trains. Uh, so uh, certainly, I think all modes. Uh, uh, certainly should go electric. And I think uh, a lot of it is actually dialogue uh, to understand the design considerations that they go through. Uh, I think, um, um, you know, it's been a, for me a, a very, you know, it's, it's a huge learning exercise to sort of understand the constraints, for example, for locomotives. Uh, so um, I think certainly, uh, you know, ships, of course, um, uh, seaplanes are a very exciting market because seaplanes are actually easily electrifiable today. Um, and in fact, Harbor Air was one of the first planes that actually demonstrated um, uh, a flight from uh, uh, across the, the US Canadian border um, near Seattle. Uh, so uh, I think, um, and, and of course, uh, there's a lot of opportunity in, in uh, Europe for different kinds of, um, uh, especially planes that you know, go between fjords and stuff like that. So um, many of these things actually can be done with near term. The, of course, um, you know, some of the harder stuff, right? Like, you know, um, long haul trucks and, and, and Regular aviation, I think, is is sort of requires much bigger battery breakthroughs. But I think there's a large sector where uh, you know uh, we we just need dialogue between the communities, and I don't think that there's enough of that. So uh, the huge opportunity there. All right, fantastic. Um, I think at this stage, what I might do is I, I'll ask Alpha and Jing to also kind of join back. And the intention of this last session is to be hopefully quite dynamic, and uh, hopefully engage in some active discussion. Uh, that's most relevant in our field that we should hopefully talk about. There's one question by, uh, apologies if I uh, <laughs> mispronounced the name, uh, Shmuel uh, Yura Shlami. And this question is to everyone. And he wants to kind of ask and pose the question of how do we make AI technologies more accessible uh, for you know, uh, poor populations, low social economic regions, such that everyone can benefit? Uh, so maybe we'll kind of, um, start with uh, Alpha and then Go Jing and then Venkat about your thoughts on this uh, topical question. Yeah, I think it's a very important one about the community recognized of differential access to technology. And I think the AI community uh, should sort of endeavor to make more tools open source. 
so that it's readily accessible. It should also, I think people are starting to create quite a lot of tutorials online, democratizing access to know-how and expertise on how to build these models. And hopefully we evolve to a model where a lot of the AI um, uh, uh, know-how and skills are all available, hopefully on YouTube or blog posts or whatnot. And there's more of an effort to systematically curate them into something that uh, can be used to educate people uh, around the world on how these tools are being used. All right, fantastic. And, and Jing, any thoughts from your side of how and you obviously work a lot with researchers, editors, and so on. What, what have you been hearing about accessibility to content? Yeah, well, so I think from a publisher's point of view, what we can help here is to provide content, to provide the uh, most cutting edge uh, research to the area that most uh, need this content. For example, the low income countries. And this is something that um, I, I think um, not only elsewhere, but all the publishers have been doing to provide free content to, to the um, low um, income countries to help them to build their um, uh, research and to uh, just to provide them with the free um, information uh, on research. Hmm. Okay, interesting. And, and Venka, very exciting work, but you've got glove boxes, you've got all these instrumentations. Any thoughts on accessibility to uh, work? Yeah, this, this, I mean, we thought about it a lot, right? I think Alpha's point is correct, right? Um, I think code accessibility is one piece, right? But then even with code accessibility, um, I, I think the challenge is many of these things, many of the methods need scale of, of compute, right? That's one aspect. Uh, so I think compute uh, in, in equity is something that needs to be figured out how to address. The other thing is access to um, equipment, right? And, and what we hope is robotic experimentation, right? You know, anyone can request an experiment, right? Um, and um, we are very close to being able to at least um, open that up to uh, to a small, small, um, you know, small uh, uh, pilot setup where we people can expire, you know, request a, request a data point, and then we can we can generate that data for them. Uh, so I think that the, I think there's a there's a continuum of sort of um, challenges uh, as we sort of you know uh, overcome one I think the distribution part is as as alpha said right is 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 solved right I think uh, there's lots of high quality tutorials in fact I, I probably watch uh, YouTube videos myself to, to catch up on the latest of what's happening uh, and so I think the the that part is quite clear I think open source code has become a common place in the machine learning community of course I will I will I will strongly again, uh, you know, say that you know it is not so. Uh, it's not so well embraced in the energy community. So uh, you know, all of you out there, right? You know, please put up your code. Um, in fact, we're building a modeling checklist, which so that um, you know you can use that checklist as a framework to ensure that you you've given everything you sort of need to uh, to ensure that your work is uh, verifiable. Uh, but but I think the there's sort of still an accessibility gap that that remains. Uh, that we should all sort of strive to address. Um, I don't have great answers on the compute inequity. I think uh, other than like, you know, some benevolent person saying, okay, here you go, here's large amount of compute, right? Uh, I think the inequity is actually gonna get bigger because as we move to larger and larger models being more accurate, you know, we're running this sort of dangerous, uh, I mean, maybe even, you know, universities don't have access to uh, that scale of compute, right? I think, uh, uh, so I think we're we're running in a very difficult era, but but hopefully, um, I think we'll uh, you know I think we'll have to address this and and asking these questions is very important. Okay, fantastic. And just kind of picking up on one of your points that your observation is that within the energy community, this open access sharing codes hasn't quite reached the same stage as other fields. I don't know if you have any thoughts about why that is and what we can do to kind of overcome it. Yeah, I, I think I think it, it's a, a lot of it has been. Uh, uh, I think uh, historically, uh, it's a competitive advantage to not give the code away, right? Uh, and uh, and certainly many groups have uh, you know uh, have had uh, you know sustained funding uh, because they are the uh, maintainers or they are the the sort of leaders in that particular area because they have access to that that code, right? Um, and one one particular community, which uh, you know I, I I was not part of at all, and and I I started entering that field, which is phase field simulations. And um, uh, there's lots of phase field simulation papers, lots and lots of them. I could not find a single one that had code, right? Uh, and so actually, we wrote a paper uh, that just gave away 
a baseline code so that people can run simulations uh, for phase speed simulations for electro deposition. So I think that uh, I think the challenge is uh, uh, you know uh, challenge is to sort of break that mindset, right? That uh, you know the community has to move forward faster, and uh, and I think uh, you you should not you should try to out innovate and not just uh, out uh, compete by uh, you know by like you know keeping things closed. <laughs> no, I think that's very topical. I, I don't know if you have any thoughts, Alpha, on that same question. Yeah, I, I think I definitely echo that uh, Venkat's sentiment that I think um, communities should strive towards openness. And I think perhaps um, public publishers can also help that by um, either incentivize having special papers or types of papers that just discloses code um, or, or well in the chemistry community, for example, Journal of Chemical Information and Modeling, they have special types of articles that just uh, pertains to reporting a, a piece of code that which is open source that acts as a carrot. The stake obviously is you know um, making sure that perhaps open source or some sort of ac equitable access is part of um, criteria for acceptance. If there's a checklist that referees can go through and you know that's part of it and it helps um, motivate incentivize um, researchers to make research outputs open. Hmm. Okay great and that kind of leads on to maybe a question for Jing that uh, as Alpha mentioned there are journals like a software x hardware x which kind of exclusively look at sharing uh, codes i don't know if you've had any thoughts or reflections on those journals as they've kind of emerged yeah so well um so i think elsewhere has uh, hardware um, x and also we have data in brief i think that's the the title so i think the 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 world the the the, the research is moving towards more open uh, more transparency um, so um, I think people are now more willing to share their codes, their data. Um, and maybe in the past um, that people didn't want to share data. Part of the reason was there wasn't a um, good facility to share data and the format is also an issue. Um, but I think the publishers are also working uh, to provide um, uh, more efficient tools um, to share and to store data um, and more journals as well um, to, to make the data more open and more useful for others. Hmm. Okay, fantastic. And there's one question which is probably quite topical that we always talk about reproducibility in research, which is obviously very, very important. I suppose this is a question to everyone. The, uh, do you see AI and machine learning uh, will help improve reproducibility in the community or will actually generate new reproducibility issues as people hide behind some sort of, uh, you know, specific neural network that they've created. Um, I don't know, maybe we'll go backwards and Jing, do you have any thoughts on reproducibility uh, and this emerging AI field? Yeah, well, AI to me is, because I, I don't have a, a artificial intelligence background, um, but to me, this is actually, it has a big potential and the potential is so, so big, I cannot really predict what it can do. Um, yes, I think that's really, this, this is more relevant to people, to, to Alpha and uh, Wencat to, uh, to answer on this. This is more relevant to their research and their, their daily research life. <laughs> yeah, any thoughts on that Alpha about reproducibility in, in the data field? Oh yeah, I think it's a it's a very dire problem. Um, I think you know experimental, which is we just means running experiment multiple times, um, and then that well, we have protocols for it. If it's mathematical simulation, then uh, it's, those are deterministic usually. But AI is uh, both stochastic, um, so if you run the same algorithm multiple times, you get multiple outputs. Um, it, it sometimes feed on experiments, like a, a beautiful work that Venkat presented. So it has that part as well. So, and also the architectures and even the minute changes in architecture can lead to huge change in performance. Um, so I think it's, it's a huge challenge for the field. Um, in terms of thoughts on um, perhaps um, as a field, we should perhaps be better at archiving exactly what we have run and to the level of random seeds and every single detail and, 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 and work towards formats. I think in the AI field, Computer science, computer scientists have started thinking about how do we exactly reproduce a computational graph of a particular algorithm down to exact reproducibility, uh, controlling the seed and having really careful um, validation procedure, like what is training, what is test, 
um, I think, and just re reporting it um, as SI or whatnot will really help at least having um, exact reproducibility. Uh, so, so someone run the code again, you get the same result. Um, in the ablation studies, so trying to understand like if you remove part of the algorithm, what's the impact of that in the result would help uh, hopefully arrive at some mechanistic reproducibility. So rather than just, you know, just input output, you can actually start understanding what's happening and what's, what are the predictable trends when you try to remove part of, parts of the algorithm. Right, and any bombshells from uh, yourself, Venkat, on this uh, topic? <laughs> no, well, uh, so so I, I I will I will make a uh, now that you asked for a bombshell, I'll make a provocative case. First of all, I agree with everything Alpha said. Um, I I think um, I, I'll just make one assertion, which uh, which is that um, uh, that um, code re co code sharing is sort of seen as a uh, as a step towards reproducibility. Uh, I think that basically is the wrong way to think about it because codes will essentially become unusable two years or three years out, right? Uh, so, you know, something will change, right? You know, you wrote in TensorFlow 1.0, uh, you know, it gets to TensorFlow 3.0, right? So it basically, I think, uh, which is why I think the point uh, that that Alpha mentioned, uh, so I, I, which is why I, I am actually against uh, uh, a lot of, the, I mean, I'm, I'm for all for open access code, open source code, et cetera. But I am against, uh, you know, lack against sort of, you know, just giving the code away as a way to substitute all of the other checks that you should do for ensuring that your models are are, are converged, model architecture principles are clear. So I think I think this is I think you know this is a very important thing that needs to be understood clearly. And I actually am I'm a bit concerned uh, that uh, and, and and in fact you know uh, I think Cellpress is instituting some of these things, right? I'm a bit concerned that. You know, we're we're taking the sort of code sharing part uh, too seriously, and not as much on the other pieces that Alpha mentioned, which is really where long-term reproducibility will lie. Because your code will be obsolete. There's no doubt about it. Everyone's code in two years or three years will be obsolete. It's it's totally. I mean, and then you'll have to rewrite everything uh, in some other package. But you can. But what you can test against are the experiments that you did to check whether you know this was working right you know taking you know skip connections all kinds of other kinds of tests that you could run robust tests you can run on the architecture and the data stream uh you know um, test train splits etc uh so uh, i think i think we should spend more time on those principal tests and less uh we, we shouldn't give a sort of uh, you know out of jail free jail free card just because someone gave the code someone shared the code ah fantastic uh, and I'm conscious that you know we we borrowing on uh, we're on borrowed time right now. So maybe we'll have one last question and thoughts for everyone to just kind of close out on because uh, we appreciate all your time. So uh, this is a question. Um, so for someone who has a chemistry or an electrochemistry background coming into AI, what sort of advice would you kind of give to those people where some of those equations can look quite scary uh, or research areas that you think um, are ripe for kind of picking? Uh, maybe we'll go backwards again uh, through uh, starting with Benkan and Alpha and then Jing. Yeah, uh, so, uh, so this is a great question. Uh, so the way I did it uh, was uh, I, 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 I teach, of course, uh, energy storage, so electrochemistry. Uh, and then uh, I just decided the best way is for me to teach a class. So I taught Bayesian machine learning uh, and, uh, and most of my students took that class. And, uh, and so I think the key is uh, to build classes that um, are taught by instructors that, that can sort of, um, uh, that have both of that, uh, both of the domain understanding so that um, they can sort of guide you through, they would have gone through personally through some of the sort of same hurdles that uh, that you are going to go through, right? So I think those kinds of classes are uh, undoubtedly very important, right? I think there's a strong, in, uh, strong tendency for students to go and take those, take these same classes in the machine learning department or computer science department or machine learning department, etc. But I think it's important that universities and um, uh, and administrators recognize that it's okay to duplicate some things, right? Uh, and uh, and the flavor of machine learning that would be taught um, by someone like Alpha, right, would be very different uh, from, um, from, let's say, someone like, you know, Michael Bronstein or, or someone else, right, uh, that would be sort of a core machine learning person, right. So, um, so I think, I think these kinds of uh, things will really help. Uh, so I think that, I think that's the sort of highest order bit for me that, that we should start building more classes 
uh, and of course exercises with the kind of data that you would work with and so on. Right, and Alpha, any final thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, just trying to, trying to think, you know, what, what, how do we got into ML? And I think um, perhaps I, I will share uh, Bankas insights that the often of the focus of, of us as of energy material scientists is often um, focused on the question of trying to address a particular material science question, address a particular scientific question. And I would say um, it, it was very helpful for me to always have that question in mind and pick the best tools that allows us to answer the question. I think often um, we see a lot of um, new machine learning algorithms, um, but um, new is not necessarily relevant because actually I would say 90% of ML uh, or even more is catered towards very high data uh, application. If we can like, crawl every single web page uh, on planet earth, then the, um, then the types of architecture that you can build would be very different to you know, uh, 16 battery cells or whatnot. And actually classical robust ML is sometimes what is required to best solve the scientific problem. And I would say focusing on these classic algorithms to just solve the science problem is often much more uh, rewarding and exciting than trying to um, necessarily engage with this very exciting development ML, but it's, it's gonna be very, very different and less useful to solving the exact questions that we are passionate about. Great. And Jing, uh, what was your uh, final words and final thoughts on this? And if I had to, if I had to add something, um, I, 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 I think uh, uh, Venka and Alpha, they both provide very um, helpful advices. Um, they have the first-hand experiences on this. Um, if I had to add one thing, uh, and if you were asking for resources, I would say review articles. Um, that's relevant to your research, which will provide you um, with the most um, up-to-date summary of the research that you may be helpful to you. Fantastic. Well, uh, uh, I'm conscious of time. So thank you once again for everyone's contribution. I personally found it amazingly interesting, especially this discussion panel to really tease out the topical questions. Um, just to remind everyone, uh, this is a three-day event, so please do tune in tomorrow where we have Dr. Huijiu Wang chairing a session focused on devices. And we also have a day three where we're going to focus on systems and community as well, where Professor Jin Zhuang is going to chair that session. But again, thank you once again. Do check out all the content online. that We've done it asynchronously, so you can do it at your convenience. And thank you once again for all your uh, kind attention and contributions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Bye. Bye.